Welcome back to the special CNBC Africa special post World Economic Forum broadcast. Still with me in studio, Laurie Dipana, Chairman, First Rand Group, Jabu Mabuza, Chairman of Telcom and the Chairperson of Business Unity South Africa, Mila Matola, CEO of Brand SA, and from our Bureau in Nairobi, Juliana Rotek, Executive Director of Usha Hidi. Jabu, any other glaring gaps in terms of what was discussed? Uh, Laurie, Laurie referred to the, 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 the issue of innovation, but I just want to just close on that uh, employment, uh, unemployment uh, uh, theme. I guess it's becoming increasingly clear, uh, as a father myself, it's becoming increasingly clear that uh, the issue that face youth unemployment is not only about whether they're going to earn an income, uh, is when they continue to be unemployed for longer, they will increasingly become unemployable. Mm. So we, we, we need to find other ways uh, that just get people to work, uh, as against get people to earn. Mm. Uh, ideally, you want to work need a more end. flexible labor environment to do that. <laughs> well, uh, at, at the session you once hosted, uh, Branwin, the Secretary General, of course, Sato has challenged us to show him the clause that uh, stops us from creating jobs, and uh, that's exactly what we said to the President. We'll be coming no, you're going to have to help with those me out a little here. Okay, now, so I, uh, what I heard in one session that is the uh, same one that again Jabu attended was that it's quite common for young people to work for companies. For, a, for nothing for a period of time, okay? Almost uh, an internship. Yeah, okay, and obviously the recommendation of one of the panelists is, 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 is that's when you can display attitude. In other words, you're working for the company for nothing, uh, they accept that you are relatively un, you know, unskilled and mm. inexperienced, but if you display the right attitude, mm. you increase your chances of being employed after that uh, by multiples. So. It's a, that, that, that was a, a, a very, very important point. But then just a little anecdote. My son is in Los Angeles at the moment learning the movie industry. So he works for, for nothing. A Again, tough experience. industry to try and understand. Yeah, no, but so I say to him, so you must get lots of jobs because you're prepared to work for nothing. He says, listen, Dad. He says, there are 10 other guys who are prepared to work for nothing, also to gain experience. He says, if you want to help me, give me some money to pay the guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but I, I think, uh, in this Lori is a relevance also in terms of the point you raised earlier around competitiveness. Because if we can you know, develop skills and uh, ensure innovation through things such as technology, which the youth are very adept at, we actually contribute to our competitiveness as a country. And I think so there is merit in considering some of these uh, you know, which solutions around how do we uh, deal with of unemployment. Juliana, just before we went to the break, uh, I, I put to the panel that potentially we need new leaders and specifically to lead the, the digital revolution. Just taking into account the context within the World Economic Forum, how do leaders come out of that debate forum and implement what they've spoken about at home and, and just starting on, on some of these topics that we're throwing around on the, the youth employment and potential solutions on this front? So um, the World Economic Forum is composed of different communities. Some of the most inspiring communities are uh, the young global leaders and also the technology pioneers and social entrepreneurs. So typically, when uh, some of us go to Davos, we're typically either um, networking with each other or other uh, people in the Davos community. And the thing is, these the innovative ways of doing things, of changing how information flows, of creating new companies and encouraging entrepreneurship, these are being done by these young global leaders. That's how they actually get to be part of the, the Davos network. Um, so when after Davos, they typically go back to doing what they do best, which is be change agents in whichever countries they are, they are in. Um, I'll tell you a very quick story of something that happened in Davos that I was extremely encouraged by. I met uh, a minister from Paraguay and he pulled up an Ushahidi map. I was extremely surprised and he showed me how he was using open source technology to do intensive poverty mapping. So the, the thing with Davos is it brings together everybody from around the world and you get to find out these linkages between uh, you could say south and south, north and south, but it, it's also sort of a cauldron of, um, uh, of 
exchanging ideas of how best to tackle the world's biggest problems. Um, Let me just, I think to, that to was studio, the most inspiring. Juliana, part. I just want to pick up Laurie there. Do you find when you come back, you are energized, you have got a new set of, of thoughts in, in terms of addressing a couple of these issues that are Yes, I, I, but look, I actually look for what I call these out of the box thinking and, uh, uh, and I always come back with uh, uh, sort of an insight. Well, I thought I never would have thought it works that way. I can give you an example if you want to. I was going to go, go there. Okay. So this was again in a session and it was came from one of the, the uh, heads of one of the uh, famous business schools of America and it was about innovation and my view was always innovation uh, creates jobs and he said hang on let me give you a different perspective. He says there are three types of innovation. The first one is empowering or disruptive innovation. That's when you produce a product like the iPad, iPod, uh, digital camera and it re completely replaces existing products. He says that creates that innovation creates jobs. Then he says you get sustaining innovations. You're simply improving um, uh, uh, a, a product. A, the example he used was you make the Prius, the, uh, which is just an adaption of the internal combustion engine mm. with batteries, okay? He says that probably maintains jobs. And then you get efficiency innovations, where you uh, are making, trying to make products and processes cheaper. He says that destroys jobs. jobs. Okay, now the first one, the empowering innovation, takes a long time, five to eight years developing these products. The last one, the efficiency innovations, are quicker. You see the results on the bottom line. So executives tend to opt for the, the, the th option three, mm -hmm. not option one, one, which is takes five to eight years, which of course does not then contribute to job creation. Now it was just, an, uh, I mean, it's just sound bites, but it's was I thought, well, I've never thought of it that way. It's an interesting analysis of looking at innovation. Do you find mm. that you're doing things differently, Miller, since you've been back in South Africa? Prompted, obviously, by the World Economic Forum and the debate that took place there. Well, I, I do think that, uh, you know, <coughs> the World Economic Forum does, uh, in, in a way, enthuse you because, uh, you know, we meet quite a lot of people and you share ideas, insights, and some of them actionable. Uh, but you are also able to share uh, what you are doing in your own country to um, you know, change the world or improve the world. And indeed, when you come back, you feel that there are things that you can uh, implement. But for me, there's an interesting thing that there's a young man I was with this morning, Sylvester Chauke, is one of the young global shapers. And he was at Davos, and he attended the session, obviously, that's relevant for him. And in his view, a lot of the issues that were being discussed there were very innovative because you had a group of young global shapers discussing innovation. And I would agree with Laurie that that's the stage. We are more in the efficiency stage. And it's when you reach the innovation stage that you really, as an economy, then really start to excel. Juliana, I think a appropriate place to go back to you here in terms of how you define innovation. Um, I do agree with that definition of innovation. And I think um, one of the key things that uh, the other panelists mentioned was the uh, efficiency bit. Because at the end of the day, uh, as a technologist uh, or as an entrepreneur, you also have to, it, it's always about the utility of the things that we, we, we do. Um, and if we talk about innovation, it's, it's not going to be, it's not going to matter unless it can actually impact people on the ground. It can actually impact their livelihood or impact their health. So um, it, it's, it's extremely important to just think about the efficiency part, but also to think about the impact and the utility part of uh, when thinking about innovation. And I think innovation is not just the, uh, the, uh, the challenge to be dealt with by technologists or, um, or entrepreneurs. It's something that actually governments can embrace. Take the open data movement. Open data can be extremely useful to inform citizens about um, everything from immigration from policies from uh, environmental issues to various things but we're not seeing that much traction around africa in kenya uh, in 2008 um, kenya was one of the first countries to join the open data movement but we're seeing that there are some challenges there and there's a lot more to do in terms of really embracing technology as a driver for lowering inefficiency 
in government systems. So no, just to focusing uh, on the, the theme art. that we're seeing from integration, from innovation, what lessons can we learn from Europe as Africa? Because we, we're big on the agenda now about regional integration. We talk very firmly about East Africa, West Africa, Southern Africa, Central Africa. Are there lessons to be learned? Did you take away anything on that front? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, uh, in the past uh, when African leaders went to Davos was to almost go and apologize and defend actions they have taken or they have not yet taken. When they were in Davos uh, this time, uh, increasingly they there to say, here is the investment community we want to sell ourselves. Uh, why you must come and in, invest in, in, in my country. So for me, what uh, became a, a lesson was I think we can do more uh, in understanding how governments work. Uh, and in the process, uh, they can also do more in understanding how the private sector works. And uh, an opportunity uh, is in this point on internships that uh, if uh, the private sector could look at uh, having interns that we employ and deploy in government uh, departments uh, with a view that uh, they could come back and be, be, be fused into, in, in, into the private sector and vice versa. Uh, that would, would cause, it, we, 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 we have seen with the financial crisis uh, of 2008 and later, that uh, the whole notion of uh, us in the free market and capitalist, uh, we we're a bit uh, uh, embarrassed. Well, Larry, at least you tab we were tabling solutions here, and, and we've got something that potentially could be a silver bullet down the line. Let's go back to to Europe. Were your fears allayed on developments in, in the global environment? No, they've. I got this feeling that the the, the world feels they've dodged a bullet. You know, there wasn't a meltdown in Europe and the fiscal cliff mm. came up with an odd answer. But to my mind, that gun is still loaded. Uh, and they, we're a long way from t total resolution. The, the developed countries' debt to equity ratio is 110%. Still. Unsustainable. Right. And we, I mean, fortunately, we're sitting at, say, 35 to, to 40%. The other take that I got out of you said lessons from Europe. Europe's population is 6 to 7% of the world's population. They're 25% of the world economy, but they're 50% of the world's social security. Now, I think that pendulum has swung too far. Can you be 6 to 7% of the population, 25% of the world's economy, but you provide 50% of the world's social security? Is that financially sustainable? Uh, so I still que big I question, questions over the I global... question that, if, it, if it's <laughs> over the long term. Uh, you know, with your help and around, remember those social security, you've got two big issues, aging of the population, and secondly, uh, uh, the whole question of health uh, insurance, because you've got the double whammy in health, technological advance that pushes up prices, plus aging. So, Another point, Miller, perhaps mm -hmm. we can touch on, was the integration between the South African delegation and other delegates from other African countries? Did you, you see much conversation happening on that front? Well, there was, before I respond to that, I think uh, to your question about learnings, I think uh, in my view, I think there's a lot that, uh, um, you know, for instance, European countries could learn about uh, from, South, from South Africa in terms of, for instance, the banking sector and how that has been managed in the country. S but to your second point, um, there was uh, quite a lot of interaction between ourselves and uh, some of the African uh, you know, counterparts uh, around issues largely of uh, regional economic integration. Some of the sessions, for instance, that uh, uh, we held were around uh, you know, what, is, what should we be doing more of to really uh, fast track the issue of regional economic integration, issues of infrastructure development. And, and those are the things that really bind us together because we were quite clear that uh, the continent will strive, will actually succeed if we can work together on those issues. You mentioned financial services. We do rank highly in terms of the, the Global Economic Competitive Report. Other issues around regulation, global financial stability, Jabu? Yeah, I, I did not pick up, uh, did not attend many sessions that were dealing more on, 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 on regulatory issues. Uh, there's just been more comments about how bureaucracy uh, inhibits uh, investment and uh, resulting in uh, uh, the, the resultant less growth. 
Juliana, what questions were investors asking around the East African space? Did you pick up any trends on that, uh, trends on that front? Um, yes, I think oh, one of there's a lot more um, knowledge about the uh, transformational power of uh, mobile. Particularly, there were many people asking me, uh, "Hey, could you tell us more about M-Pesa?" Particularly during the social technology context con conversation. So. Um, uh, th that generated a lot of interest because the idea that in another couple of years most people will not really have a wallet, they'll mostly be transacting using mobile money seemed fascinating to a lot of people. So in that particular context there was um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of surprise actually that a lot of money, almost a quarter of Kenya's GDP flows through the M-Pesa system. Um, that was a, uh, there was a lot of interest there and also a lot of interest in the young entrepreneurs who are coming out of Africa and also a lot of discussion about uh, censorship uh, and uh, the challenges that are being presented by the digital economy that we're in right now. Jabu, World Economic Forum Africa is the next stage that we'll have to, to debate issues. That is happening in May in Cape Town. You mentioned earlier in the conversation that you want to see employment being a bigger theme across the board. What else would you like to see on the Africa agenda? Uh, yeah, I, I think this, this, this question of uh, uh, how uh, we see the continent uh, as, as a single market. Uh, and how that, seeing it as a single market, is being given real meaning in the movements of goods and people, uh, bearing in mind that uh, there are all sorts of other challenges that might uh, be unintended that that would come out of that. But there's no doubt in my mind that uh, we uh, need to, to see ourselves as part of the, the half a billion uh, consumers with the, the one trillion dollar type of, uh, of, 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 of a market. So we need to start thinking that way. So I'm hoping those people that will be shaping the agenda for the May uh, uh, regional conference have, 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 uh, will, will start to, 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 to direct debates uh, to, to, towards that type of approach. Miller, what, what focus areas would you like to see come with Africa? Well, in addition to the regional economic integration one that Jabu has mentioned, I think uh, the, the youth issue becomes important uh, because you think about it more probably than 60% of uh, the people or population on the continent is probably below the age of 24. So, so for us, there should be a bigger focus, especially in the light of the unemployment issue. Uh, and Larry, let's get your thoughts. Uh, I'd like to see the uh, role that agriculture can play in that lift of Africa. Now, uh, I mean, it's happening to a degree already and that is that many countries with fantastic agricultural land are inviting competent farmers from the continent to come and farm there. So, I mean, it, it, Africa truly has the potential to become the food basket of the world. It's got enormous agricultural potential. And yeah, we've got farmers eking out a living in the northwest province on arid land when they could be farming in parts of Africa uh, where it's much more fertile and crop yields are multiples of what they achieve in South Africa. Mm -hmm. The tricky point is who owns the land. Now I've got a very simple view of that. The hotel operators, and Jabu knows that, they, the hotel operators, they're quite comfortable with not owning the bricks and mortar, not so. Mm -hmm. Let a pension fund own that. Just give me the management contract. And I think farmers are sort of fixated unnecessarily in my view on owning the land, which is an emotional issue. But property rights are, are going to continue to be a big debate point. Uh, th that also, there must be good property. But, but you want to, be the, the farmer must say, give me the farming contract if you're happy that I'm competent. And I'll farm the land for you and become to some form of sharing arrangement on the crop or something like that. But at least lift the agricultural potential of Africa. It's not, a, uh, making it sound easy, it's not. But I'd like to see that on the agenda. I think we tabled at the beginning there are no silver bullets no, to no, any no, of these right. problems, but uh, certainly it's worth debating and coming no. up with, with innovative solutions. Juliana, again, that, that East African voice into what you would like to see on the stage at World Economic Forum Africa in May? The role of technology, uh, particularly around creating opportunities and also intra-African trade and lowering the barriers for communication within Africa. We should not be paying 
uh, almost double, triple the cost to call Ghana, to call Nigeria, to call South Africa. Um, it's much cheaper for me to call the US than to call my fellow African uh, counterparts. So really there's a lot more to be done around broadband access. Uh, we could use voice over IP to communicate and to just open up the markets so that uh, solutions that are created in Kenya can also be uh, exported within Africa to, uh, to the utility of other Africans. And uh, I just think in conclusion, in true World Economic Forum style, just a, a brief soundbite from each of you in terms of the, the WEF Davos 2013, the, the key lesson, uh, Laurie, and, and perhaps just in summary across the board, let, let's start with you, sir. Well, I suppose to be the key lesson is uh, never to get into the position that many parts of the developed world have got into with this, the debt to equity, or the debt to GDP ratios uh, explode out to 90% plus. And because once you're in that debt trap, it takes years, decades to get yourself out. So you need a strong political will, non-populist policies to maintain sound finances in, the, in emerging markets. Miller? Well, um, I think uh, the important lesson one takes away is that uh, you know, the challenges uh, we face uh, might seem amplified when we are here, but uh, the whole world is facing the same challenges. And I think it's much more what's required is actually cooperation, collaboration, whether it's between business, uh, government, and civil society. You need uh, a co-created uh, future, and that calls for all of us to work together. Juliana, before I go to Jabu, a quick thought from your side, just in conclusion. I think he captured it perfectly. It's about cooperation and co-creating the future. And uh, if I may just end with the quote from uh, President Kagame that we need to continue talking about a new African story that we completely own and chart the course. And uh, final word, Jabu Mabuza. Yeah, uh, the, 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 there is no silver bullet uh, for all the the ills that uh, confront us as a continent, we need uh, economic growth. Uh, you can't have jobs without growth. You can have uh, growth, uh, jobless growth, but you can't have uh, growthless jobs. Perfect place to, to end this discussion. We've come to the end of the CNBC Africa special live post World Economic Forum broadcast. Thank you to my guests, Larry Dipana, First Round Group, Jabu Mabuza, Telcom, Mila Matola, Brand South Africa, and also Juliana Rotik Ushahidi. Until next time, from me, Bernard Nielsen. Goodbye.